Uh, yeah, so good evening. My name is Mike Marchant. I'm the Head of Investigations at, at Open Secrets, uh, and I'm going to be facilitating the discussion this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here tonight for the launch of Open Secrets' latest report, Who Has the Power? South Africa's uh, Energy Profiteers. Uh, thank you also for braving the incredible heat today. We were saying, just being cautious about feedback. We were saying that it is slightly fitting today, given how hot it was for a discussion of this nature. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some introductions, um, some housekeeping things, and a, and a small overview of the report. Just on the housekeeping issues, uh, please do switch your phone to silent now if you haven't uh, done so already, and just be aware that we are recording this event. So for those of you who know people who are keen to join, who want to watch it afterwards, it is going to be made available for full discussion. Um, and if for any reason you have any cause to walk to that side of the room, please just note that the camera is there, so please don't walk in front of it. Um, and I, I think that's it. In terms of the order of events for this evening, uh, we have a great panel of speakers to my left chair, and we're going to start off after an introduction with some questions to them for about 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to ask for their, their inputs on a kind of a range of topics that we'll cover um, not quite the breadth of the report, because as you'll see, we try and cover a great amount of ground uh, in, this, in this report. Uh, but as much as we possibly can. At that point, we're going to switch over to an input that is coming to us uh, via video from the United States from activist Kumi Naidu, who unfortunately couldn't be with us in person, but we're really excited, is uh, able to, to join us to give an input for about 15 minutes, and then also for that to join the panel for a Q&A session after that for about 30 minutes. Um, and so that's what we'll move to immediately after that. I do want to uh, stress right now that hopefully anticipating lots of questions and lots of inputs from people in the room who, who want to give inputs but also ask questions. We will have a, an entire period after the event formally ends where there will be refreshments and there will be an opportunity to engage further with the people who are here in person. Um, so if you aren't able to get that question in, um, at that point, let them feel we will have an opportunity to do so. So moving on to introducing uh, the panel to my left. So immediately uh, here we have Zen Mate. Zen is an investigator at Open Secrets. She holds a BA in International Studies uh, and a postgraduate diploma in Sustainable Development from Stellenbosch University. Uh, worked as a postgraduate researcher at the Center for Complex Systems and Transition, CST, at Stellenbosch working predominantly on state capture. And she is now what we like to call our resident coal expert, uh, and the MEC expert, Zen, can talk to you about the mineral energy complex all day. That's a very good thing. Uh, to her left, we have Abby May. Abby is also an investigator at Open Secrets, holds an MPhil in Justice and Transformation from UCT, and her research interests include societal transitions, historical processes, social justice, artificial intelligence, <laughs> anthropology, and politics. Um, and Abby here tonight particularly for input on the renewable energy space and a great deal of work that she's been doing on that uh, over the course of this year. And then last but not least, uh, Lutando Verkazi on the far left. Uh, Lutando is a lawyer at Open Secrets, uh, completed her LLB at the University of Cape Town and completed her articles with a focus on corporate mining and environmental law. And I look forward to getting into that a little bit later this evening. Uh, since then, she's worked uh, for various civil society organizations with a focus uh, on human rights, women's land rights, as well as renewable energy and the just transition. Uh, so thank you for joining us this evening. Um, everyone here, including myself, has contributed research to this report, and there are a range of people, including the front row here, that have also contributed. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Zen was the lead author of the report. So before I kick off with the first question, I, I just wanted to give uh, a short introduction to this report, a little bit of framing and explanation of how we've come to this work. So this is Open Secrets' uh, first, uh, first report that we've put out, or first significant piece of work that we've put out as part of our new thematic area that we are calling Climate Justice, uh, uh, Climate Crisis Profiteers. Um, for those of you who know Open Secrets' approach and Open Secrets' work, our focus is on the nexus between private sector power, private sector monopoly power, 
and economic crime and corruption. And a great deal of our work has focused on state capture, but again, with a particular focus on the, the often invisible role of private corporations and particularly professional enablers in the world of economic crime and state capture, both in South Africa and elsewhere. And what we're seeking to do in our, in our nascent work on the climate, climate justice, but also those inhibitors to a just transition into climate justice, is to bring that lens uh, very much in that approach to our work to this, this area of work. And so what this report tries to do is it's our preliminary scoping, in a sense, our mapping of the private interests that have embedded themselves in different parts of the energy sector in South Africa and have positioned themselves to profit now from ongoing uh, you know, work in, in coal and oil and gas, but also those new private actors that are increasingly positioning themselves to profit from any transition that there is into renewable energy. And we've tried to take as critical a lens as, as we can to all of those, all of those sectors. Th there's two things that I wanted to, uh, the last things that I will say, and I will stop rabbiting on right now, but the, the last two things from a framing perspective is that, as I've said, this report is an attempt to map ownership patterns and key private players in, in these different sectors. Uh, and it's very much preliminary work. And so the report does not seek uh, to, to be of any groundbreaking, never before seen information about corruption in the energy sector. But what we do hope it is, is one of the first times that there's been a systemic effort to bring together information in the public domain about private sector involvement in multiple sectors. And in a, systemic fashion, in a systemic fashion, how those private sector actors relate to regulatory bodies and politicians in South Africa, and how they use that influence uh, to benefit from and profit from the energy crisis, but also uh, any just transition. Um, and the second thing I would say is that we are, and we're trying to be deeply mindful of the fact that, as I've said, this is our first work in this area, and that we're doing uh, work in an area where activists, civil society organizations, and social movements have been doing this work for decades uh, and have been challenging both corruption but also corporate power that has led in part to an energy crisis, to socioeconomic harm and to environmental destruction. Uh, and when you do work your way through this report, you will see that this report leans and, and uh, relies heavily on the work of others, uh, and many of whom are, are in the room tonight. Uh, and so we'd welcome, of course, your inputs uh, as well as we go through. So with that introduction in mind, uh, Zen, I'm going to turn to you first. And uh, for those who had a chance to open the report, the introduction, the very first title is uh, A Time of Crises. So plural, not just one crisis. We seem to have multiple in South Africa. And Zen, I was hoping if you could just kick us off by reflecting on what those multiple crises are that, that we discussed in that introduction, how they overlap, and also how we've got here. Great, thanks, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Um, just to touch quite briefly on Mike's question, just to land us before I hand over to my colleagues. Um, and we actually said before this, we've been trying not to get too bogged down in context, so I'll try to be brief. Please raise your eyebrows if I'm not. <laughs> um, so I think just about the multifaceted layer of the crisis we face, I think just to kick us off, we start the report off um, in just uh, taking a moment to, to, to kind of outline what happened in 2002 with the KZN floods. Um, and I think that was a moment for us as a country where we saw you know, the failure of infrastructure and environmental degradation and you know, the failure of the state kind of playing out in, in what was essentially a, a disaster and, and devastating with more than, I think, 400 people um, dying um, from, as a result of those floods. Um, and, and just to take the moment to also say that it was mostly, predominantly, people in informal settlements that were most affected. Um, and when we're thinking about you know, why now, why this matters, and why that there is this need for a pressing response um, to the, the, the conversation on the climate crisis. Often people don't think the, the, the environmental degradation to the human cost, and I think um, we are in a country, because we're faced with 
so many layers of crises where often the conversation is you're talking about the climate but we have so many issues as a country and as people and and um, what we try to do by rooting and beginning the report in, in in the fact that these two things are not separate they one and the same and not mutually exclusive we we i think um yeah, take that as a point of departure and use that as the lens as we go through the report. I mean, and and um, to add on to, to that reality, we're a country that's also faced with an energy crisis. And so, again, the link between our environmental uh, struggles, but also um, the effect on, on, on social and, and, and human um, uh, people. And so, you know, in our country now, the energy crisis, we face rolling blackouts for, for days. And so between actually January 2023 and October 2023, there was, I think, 2.5 hours um, where we had no load shedding as a country. And when you're thinking about an energy crisis um, and electricity crisis, that, that, that's two days without um, rolling blackouts. And the issue with that further is that we highlight that a lot of these communities, a lot of people, a lot of people in South Africa go 12 hours without power as a result of whether when load shedding is coming back, the infrastructure can't take the voltage and the entire um, community is without power for longer than what would have been um, the load shedding hours and, and, and the fact that um, that is part of, of, of the issue. And on top of that, another layer is that we're, we're faced with huge unemployment. Youth unemployment in our country is sitting at 60.7% um, and continues um, to, to grow. And while we are also facing that, um, even if you are employed, the cost of living has risen to the point where it's real stagnant growth um, in, in income, um, where the same amount of money is not buying you, is not going enough. Um, to, to, to buy what it could um, a couple of years ago. And to that effect, we we'll speak to the fact that currently the most recent stats show that uh, the average household food basket in our country is 5,000 Rand at the moment. And that is pretty insane. Um, and, 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 and when we're talking about 60.7% you know, of unemployment, and even if you are employed, 5,000 Rand household food basket is is, is difficult to contend with. So, and while that's happening, while we're facing rolling blackouts, we also faced a March 2023 increase in our electricity tariff of 18 points, I think 65. And so you have a situation where you are facing rolling blackouts and um, an increase in electricity, and the people in the country paying more for electricity that they're receiving less of um, in a country where the household food basket is now 5,000 Rand. And when you juxtapose that to the fact that 1% of the people in South Africa own more than 40% of the country's wealth, you are also talking about huge inequality. And actually the World Bank's, I think, most recent report from towards the end of the year, last year, September 2022, um, it, um, it reviews 164 countries and South Africa was number one um, in the world for the most unequal country. And so when we're talking about multifaceted layers of crises, um, that is precisely where we, we, we root ourselves. It is in that context that when we say we're thinking about the energy profiteers or the climate crisis that we should um, be cognizant of the fact that that is our reality. And when we're thinking about what next um, and what to do and how we engage with the climate work and energy profiteers and um, that's what we're thinking about and just on um, the fact that our history you know we have a minerals energy industrial complex where you have a history of um, apartheid where you know uh, the link to our minerals energy complex locked us into an energy intensive minerals intensive economy that relied on um, that was built on the back, the blacks of black people in our country, <laughs> <laughs> the backs of black people in our country, and gave rise to a huge um, white economic elite, um, uh, which was characterized by powerful multinational corporations, the likes of De Beers, um, and Anglo America. And so, when we're also thinking about our context, we're also taking a historical glance about our context. 
to say that this is, you know, when we talk about how, I think the second part of the question is how did we end up here, is this is, you know, our inheritance in the country where um, a system and an economic system created deep divides, um, which we're still bearing the brunt of now, um, and, um, you know, con then uh, linking that to contemporary state capture, um, where hollowed out state fiscuses and hollowed out um, funds are, have meant that the government isn't able, even if they would have, but you know, that's up for debate, to provide social security protection mechanisms um, to, to, to the country. So yeah, that's where we begin, and that's the lens through which we try to, to look at the powerful corporations that um, you know, still hold the, the energy mix um, in our country. Thanks so much, Zen. Yeah, we, we speak at Open Secrets quite often about joining the dots, and Zen has given us about many dots to join. <laughs> but I think it is really important because that, that framing is going to come back throughout the discussion because this notion of it has been obviously politicized and weaponized in South Africa that opposition, for example, to oil and gas is anti development. And we have a lot of, and we have to grapple with those arguments, right? We're going to have to come back to that. Um, also, just you starting off in KZN, I think that powerful quote that the report starts with from Abashali Basim Jondolo from social movements in KZN saying that in South Africa, natural disasters have become entwined with political disasters, often resulting in devastation for the poor. And I think it is incredibly powerful to imagine an organization like Abashali, which faces systemic service delivery failure, endemic political violence against them and their leaders, regular assassinations on top of having to deal with the consequences of natural disasters and the, and the costs of, of runaway climate change, really captures that, that, that embedded nature, I think, of, and overlapping of, of the problem. Um, Lutando, same problems, different lens, in a sense. I mean, what are our rights in this regard? Uh, there have been, you know, there's a lot of litigation going around in South Africa. That's its own question, which we won't necessarily grapple with tonight. But a lot of it increasingly is around a whole host of constitutional rights that touch on these various parts of the crises, whether it's power, environment, and, and other things. So, I mean, what are our constitutional rights in this regard? We have none. No. <laughs> um, um, thanks, Mike, um, and good evening, everyone. So, before I get to the two rights which I'd like to discuss here, um, namely Section 24, which is the right to be free from an environment that is harmful to one's well-being, um, and the more sort of nebulous, contentious right to the supply of electricity, I do want to just remind all of us that. Our energy crisis is only one that has become a national question because we are experiencing load shedding at the scale. But fundamentally, there are pockets of our communities and our society who have not had a supply of electricity for decades. Um, they've not known what it means to have consistent supply of water, electricity, um, social security in a number of ways that is fundamentally impacted by the uh, insecurity of electricity supply. Um, so obviously we would hope that our constitution is one that is uh, a tool to, uh, to give back that dignity and to give back restitution um, in, in ensuring that the most vulnerable groups in our society are protected. So what does it say? Um, as I said, there's the, the right to an environment that's free from uh, environmental degradation and harm to your well-being. And that's one that is really important because one thing that people often forget is that when we define what the environment is, obviously we're talking about natural resources here. We're talking about rivers, forests, ocean, land. But the definition of environment fundamentally includes people's well-being. And it's important to think that when we consider what a climate crisis is and we talk about what is the just energy transition, when we talk about people, that is the environment too. Um, and it's something that's encapsulated in the principal piece of legislation, the National Environmental Management Act. Um, in section two, it outlines beautiful principles that uh, reflect a whole larger discussion in the international community on what are the fundamental things that we need to achieve sustainable development goals and what have you. Um, and the, the sort of takeaway from those principles is that it's, it's important to balance the need to protect the environment and conserve that 
as well as ensuring that people's lives are A, able to function, but also um, is not harming them. Uh, but one of the issues, obviously, that comes up there is, well, how do we do that? And the approach that Nina takes and the subsequent um, pieces of legislation that follow uh, is kind of unfortunate, but unavoidable. It doesn't say that we deserve an environment that is absolutely 100% pure. The approach is that pollution is inevitable. What can we do to mitigate that as much as possible? And that's how government deals with that. Um, but we do have a right to an environment that is free from harm. Energy uh, extraction and distribution is fundamentally within that realm as well. Um, and then the right to electricity, which I think is kind of something that we all <laughs> are very concerned about right now. Um, it's not technically a right in the Bill of Rights, but our courts have um, recently, the most recent judgment, um, Last year, the Constitutional Court in the Ball River Development Association case, <laughs> God, the lawyers, um, <laughs> uh, they, they sort of tried to outline what is a right to electricity and is it something that we can use um, in trying to ensure that we also have access to other rights that are related to it, dignity, housing, um, water, social uh, service delivery. And, the unfortunate thing is that we don't really have one. Our courts are loath to fundamentally lay it out. Um, and it makes sense that they would be cautious of doing that because that would mean encroaching on powers of other areas of government, such as you know, uh, the executive and the legislature. And we're left with the case now where most of the cases that have gone to court where people try to evoke this right to electricity it only happens because their municipality is not supplying them with uh, electricity because their municipality is not paying ESCOM. Of course, the municipality has a right to people to supply electricity, but ESCOM doesn't necessarily, as an SOC, have a right that is, or a duty rather, that is owed to those people. Their duty is to supply the municipality with electricity. So we have a strange kind of nexus where fundamentally people are not receiving something that the courts recognize as fundamental to the achievement of other rights. Um, but they'll usually chastise them for not arguing it properly. Potentially, maybe someone out there wants to bring a case on Section 271C on Social Security, I don't know. Um, holla at me if you're interested. <laughs> but um, it, 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 again, what you mentioned before, you have to come to court in order for the judiciary to make any kind of pronouncement. That means you have to have money. But you said we're not talking about that today. So. <laughs> um, and then the last point I just wanted to make is that even if we did have a right to electricity, um, we must remember that every right has a duty. And government's right to uh, give effect to rights and the Bill of Rights is a requirement by the Constitution. But our courts have said that that is only that duty only needs to be realized progressively. Essentially, they can do it however they like as long as it's considered reasonable. And what government considers reasonable can be constrained by a whole lot of political, financial limitations. And we know that obviously it doesn't work, but South Africa is an experiment, so we've got to try and give them a chance, I guess. Yeah, I think I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. And we are going to have to come back to this question about progressive realization because it always it does also come back to who the state claims is blocking the realization of access to electricity. But um, we will come back to that question. I do want to move fairly quickly to the more nitty gritty about um, you know the various companies and others that that we identify as being key in the report. But maybe the final kind of framing question, Abby, would, would go to you, and it's to take us zoom out a little bit further, even from South Africa, because there's a realization I think that there are uh, you know South Africa doesn't have a South African climate crisis; the globe has a climate crisis, um, and there are also various international commitments that South Africa has made. And I, I think from your perspective, also looking at the renewable space, I mean, what are some of the relationships and tensions you see? between those global commitments and, and the local reality of what's happening here? So, South Africa's name is incredibly complicated 
complicated situation at the moment where we are in a microcosm of our own local energy crisis while at the same time having to be a global participant in the global climate change crisis, right? Um, and because of that, um, we've not only made commitments locally uh, to how we're going to kind of get out of both of those crises, but we've made commitments internationally as well. Um, one of the most important commitments that we've made so far is the 2015 uh, Paris Climate Change Accords, right? So a variety of governments around, around the world signed on to those, those accords, and basically the aim is for each country to take on a position and, a, and an agenda on how to reduce your own uh, global climate change greenhouse emissions, right? And South Africa committed to that, we're a signatory onto that. But also quite recently with the Presidential Climate Commission's uh, Just Energy Transition Framework, I know it's a mouthful, but it matters, I promise. Um, they, they stated in our South African context and how we view as South Africa the just energy transition, um, it's not only people-centered, but at the same time, we outright made the position that we want to reach net zero carbon emissions as well, right? That is a, a position that our government has taken. So all of these are global commitments that our government has taken, but at the same time, they are also having to deal with this energy crisis, like my colleagues have explained as well. And what is interesting is that the tensions between those two crises are unfolding in ways that are bringing about incredibly harmful consequences. I'll give you one example. Um, so our Minister of Electricity, Hamahopa, who's, you know, I mean, he's also the acting financial minister because he has time. <laughs> but uh, he recently came out in November and stated that, you know, South Africa, one of the, the commitments South Africa made with the Climate Accords was to decommission about eight of our coal power stations, right? And in November, he came out and stated that, sorry, uh, we can't do that anymore. Um, and unfortunately, the political sentiment that he used around that was because we need coal to produce electricity, right? Doesn't, obviously doesn't make sense because, you know, we don't have electricity, you know, on a constant <laughs> basis. But that was, that was the, the sentiment that he used and it didn't make, it didn't make much sense. But if you, if you bring it back a layer, and you look a little bit deeper into it, um, I'm going to use um, something that's in said. So, you know, in that period that you mentioned between January and August of this year, uh, we only experienced like two days of proper, you know, electricity, right? Um, so when the coal power stations aren't functioning, right, we use what's supposed to be emergency backup power, which is diesel, so the open gas turbine cycles. And Petra SA is obviously the main, um, the main uh, corporate that provides, um, provides the diesel for, for that and the gas for that, right? And interestingly, in this year, uh, Petra SA you know, came out and stated that they finally made a profit out of like since eight years, they've made a profit this year, which says a lot about the fact that what does it mean for, for us to remain within an energy crisis while going back on our commitments in the global, global climate change crisis, right? Um, and at the same time, having these big corporations profit off of that. Um, yeah, those are, those are some of the key tensions that's kind of playing out. And we'll speak a bit more about some of, um, some of the other political, political positions of our ministers as well, which is also really interesting. But yeah, that's my answer. Thanks, Abby. I, I mean, the point about Petro SA I think is particularly interesting, given that, I mean, Petro SA 
for those who, who have followed it, is has a 20-year history of paying front companies that then pay the ANC as party funding, uh, using procurement fraud to enrich executives uh, that then get left behind. That procurement that's happened from ESCOM, for the most part, has happened at least at a one rand fifty per litre premium, um, which is still unexplained. Uh, and of course, when ESCOM did apply to the DMRE for a license to import directly at a lower cost, that, that was denied. Um, and I think we can even get onto a little bit later this, this uh, proposed new petroleum company that would merge Petro, SAAC, F, etc. into one giant state petroleum company. Um, and obviously the crisis is profitable in that sense, particularly from the, the diesel perspective. Um, so it's a, it's a really useful thing to, to remind us of. Uh, Zen, coming back to you, and, and this is to really get into one of the, or the heart of one of the major issues of the report, and I've, I've mentioned it already, is that Minister Gwede Mantasha, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, not always in a coherent fashion, but at least at a scattergun approach, accuses those who are opposed to new coal, oil and gas, clean coal, according to Gwede. Um, as being anti-development, anti-progress, as holding us back right, um, from, uh, from development. And, and these are sometimes the, you know, stopping us from addressing some of those crises that you mentioned at the beginning. And I guess I have a twofold question. The one is, what is the extent of the proposed new developments of, of coal, oil and gas that, that you and others have identified in the report? Um, you know, just how big are those plans for, for new investment in fossil fuels? And then the second part of the question is, you know, how, do you, how do you respond to, to that argument? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to try again to be brief. Um, raise the eyebrows if I'm not, sorry. Um, so we kind of have this twofold response from government. I think Greta's, uh, Greta Montage's, uh captures the one end, and I think, as colleagues have spoken, there's another end. So I think Abby and Matanda spoke to that. And so I think we have, on the one hand, international commitments, which we are signatories of, such as the Paris Agreement um, and the like, and we have national, um, local framings of um, our own institutional framework that kind of binds us in a way, um, supposed to guide our, our decisions when it comes to the space. Um, in 2002, or 2021, I'm not sure, um, we had President Sora Maposa instituting, you know, a, a, a climate commission, um, the PCC, the Presidential Climate Commission, and that was tasked this is now very recently tasked with not really dealing with the energy crisis, but also helping setting out a plan, um, the Just Energy Transition Plan, which I haven't mentioned, to, to deal with, with climate change and to tackle our energy issues. So we have this very, um, on this one hand, um, yeah, these global commitments, these local commitments and local action in the sense of these, uh, with the com presidential commission. And then, um, and, and this professed move away from fossil fuels and this professed um, investment in renewable energy and the big drive and that's part of the rhetoric and the narrative. And then on the other side, at the same time, which it should be stressed, uh, we have uh, the, our Minister of Energy. It would have been better if it was another minister. <laughs> part of another portfolio, but I mean, yeah, the irony rests in the fact that it's our energy minister, which I think makes the irony all the more stuck, um, saying um, that we should be um, investing in oil and gas. And just to draw on Abby's point about um, the crises, um, in our country, I think we have this thing where we, where there's a trend, if we look quite carefully, I think we've had this conversation about where crises that are profitable um, and are used to to push certain tender processes um, into um, fast drive and to fast track. And before anybody knows what's happening, we open our eyes and, and we're in a 20 year contract with, um, for example, in this particular um, example, oil and gas companies. Um, just to link a little bit to the macro global context, um, when Greta Mantashi says something like it's anti-development. Um, 
the, the, the narrative that's coming forth that's saying we should invest in oil and gas, the companies that have been earmarked or have been granted drilling rights or have been granted tenders um, or um, yeah, to provide the state with um, with oil and gas are, number one, I think is uh, Total Energies, which is a French company, and then we have Car Powership, quite particularly, which is um, uh, a subsidiary of a Turkish company. So when we are talking about anti-development, it's again the question of, for you know, to the benefit of who, and, and, and to what end. And um, in the particular example of oil and gas, we, in, there's no, we currently don't really have um, oil and gas um, providing us with electricity in this country in our energy mix. We mostly have oil and gas being um, provided to Petro SA, another, as we mentioned, um, multinational, corporate, multinational corporation, um, for, um, yeah, for the running of its industry. So it's not really providing us with electricity. When Gwede Mantashe said, um, used um, the fact that we could end load share by by granting you know by 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 granting these companies the rights to drill and provide us with emergency energy that will end the load shedding crisis, um, you you then have a situation where you're taking something where we're not quite locked into yet and using a crisis to 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 kind of create something called we write in the report anchor demand. So we we don't rely currently on gas to provide us with uh, gas and oil to provide us with electricity. And so when you are granting these companies um, these drilling rights, you're, um, you're granting them um, a right to provide us with energy, with something that we need to build a new infrastructure for them to do. So it's, it's, you're, you're creating anchor demand in an energy, in a resource, in a fossil fuel that um, we, don't, we aren't currently locked into. So you're using a crisis to manufacture um, infrastructure that doesn't exist with multinational corporations from foreign jurisdictions to provide us with energy um, and locking us in 20-year contracts um, to do that. And when we're looking, for example, at the coal industry, um, currently Exara and Seriti uh, are the two big ESCOM suppliers. So they're the multinational corporations that supply 80% of ESCOMs coal and power. And so we're talking about the big players, we're talking about companies such as that, that have kind of existed over the years. Um, and when we are talking about transitioning, not only do we have to unpick ourselves from a minerals energy complex that we got locked into 20 years, 50 years ago, we are now also using this crisis to recreate the status quo, essentially. Global companies coming in, building infrastructure, locking us into 20 year contracts, using an emergency to do that and to bypass regulation mm -hmm. and to fast track the process. And again, we're going to wonder, oh, how do we get here? How do we unlock ourselves from this mineral energy industrial complex? And I think this is what we find is the pattern across the sectors. And when you follow the money often and you follow the corporations, it then allows this picture of what actually is happening to be drawn out um, from a different kind of um, lens. And when we're thinking about, um, in this report, what we say, how do we respond to that? We pitch that we're at a crossroads in our country. There's this opportunity with the context of you know, our failing fossil fuel infrastructure, our energy crisis with the fossil fuel fleet, that's not only failing, but it's struggling to meet our energy demands and needs. Um, and the drop in renewable energy prices and this new climate in global and um, local incentives to invest in renewable energies and international support, we're, at, we're in a different context that allows us to actually um, rethink and to take opportunity in this window um, to, to not only go green by investing in renewables, but also to do so in a way that would facilitate a joint transition, which we argue would, would A, go behind, but actually um, help address the economic divides in our country. And at Democracy, we didn't do that, you know? We were locked into multinational corporations with economic deep divides, and when we transitioned, um, things remained the same economically. 
here we have an opportunity to allow a particular, not allow, to ensure, to help push a particular type of shift that is inevitable, but um, essential for us to do it differently. So we kind of wrap up two scenarios. So there's the first scenario where you could have multinational corporations ensuring that fossil fuels remain, and that's the likes of the big banks, such as Standard Bank, who will continue to invest in new developments um, of fossil fuel infrastructure, even though there's a professed international and local commitment for us to move away from that. Behind the scenes, for example, we have 23 new coal-fired power stations being built in a country where we can barely keep the ones we have going, right? And when we're thinking about the big money, you need big money, and we have the big banks investing in those. And then, so you could have scenario one, where we have big multinational corporations ensuring that we don't shift, and then in scenario two, we could have big multinational corporations coming in and taking the space up in the renewable energy sector and ensuring that, you know, we go green, but um, in, we, we maintain the status quo. We present a different way um, where we say this is a chance for us to take the step now. And we know government's not going to do it, we know corporations are not going to do it unless there's pressure um, and a watching brief, you know, held on them to, to ensure that they're accountable to what they say um, internationally and locally. But, um, for us not to miss this chance for what will be an inevitable shift to be a just one. Thanks, and there's a, oh, again, there's a lot there to unpack, um, which I think we can more in the, the Q&A. And there was one thing in particular that you said that is also really important to note, is that the professional, the world of finance and professional enablers that surround this push into new fossil fuel uh, production. I mean, one of the statistics in the report that really is, is really telling is that between 2019 and 2021, there was 2.8 billion US dollars in loans from African commercial banks that went into new coal uh, around the continent. 97% of that came from South Africa's banks, right? And Standard Bank is number one of those. And in a little bit, we will be speaking to one of the people who was forcibly thrown out of Standard Bank a few months ago for trying to raise this issue. Um, and then I think the other things then that you kind of touch on, and it is important to raise, is this for multinational corporations and many of the other corporations in here, there's a short termism that works for them. And so all of the research increasingly is indicating that any push into massive new gas will only leave the country with a whole host of stranded assets that can't be used, right, beyond a few decades. And yet, is there increasingly a calculus from private corporations that there's a window to make a lot of money very fast in the next 20 years and then leave the state with the bag, right? And that's something that they've done not just in this sector, but in many others. And I think it's, it's something that's, that's deeply disturbing. Um, speaking of some deeply disturbing, Lutando, and sticking with the DMRE for, for just a little bit longer before Abby come to you on the renewables. You've got a lot of uh, personal experience, professional experience, working with the Department of, of Mineral Resources and Energy, and I'm particularly keen to hear your insights into how that department functions, in particular in, in its relationship with the big private actors, both in mining and energy. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why I was working with the department. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, the, the headline is that DM, or DMR as it was, DMR now, and the interests of private companies, particularly mining companies, are, which are represented by the Minerals Council, previously the Chamber of Mines, they're in bed with each other. Everybody loves each other. They like to act like they are at odds with each other in, you know, in the public eye. But when one looks at the way policy is developed, when one looks at the way in which um, legislation is amended, and one looks at the way the regulator um, seeks compliance, it's very clear that it, they do not want to lose the interests of mining companies and energy companies in South Africa. Um, and I think it's also important to talk about uh, the eras of the DMR, right? We initially, we had the Mosavensi Zwane, or most recently, the Mosavensi Zwane era, and I, I don't know if uh, you all remember who that was, this, our famous 
Dairy Queen, um, <laughs> who was involved in the Estima Dairy Farm scandal where 280 million lands were used in uh, corrupt and uh, fraud and misappropriation of public funds. Um, at that time, when he was the minister, the Minerals Council was not interested in him. They didn't like him. They didn't like that he was a Zuma appointment. They didn't like that he was uh, robust about empowerment requirements, and that, that has to do with the EE, obviously, and um, making sure that there is redistribution of uh, profits amongst disadvantaged people. Um, they took him to court multiple times, um, and eventually, under Cyril's cabinet, got Gwede. And they made it very clear, and you can find loads of articles of Roger Baxter, who was the former CEO of the Minerals Council, um, raving about how uh, Minister Mandashe is the girl, um, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it makes sense, right? Zen already told us uh, Minister Mandashe is pushing for oil and gas to be the answer to our energy crisis. That is good for the Minerals Council, that is good for energy um, companies in South Africa. And we're doing that. At the same time, I mean, so recently uh, the Minerals Council published a report on facts and figures. Um, one, of the, one of the sections relates to coal, and coal makes up the second highest membership within that, um, within that uh, representative group. They said that even though there's likely going to be less of a demand for coal over the years as ESCOM reduces its emissions and closes down coal power plants, um, they're looking to export markets as a way to continue to drive their profits in their bottom line. So there is no intention from private corporations who are currently contributing to our climate crisis to reduce their own emissions in the way in which they extract natural resources. Which also means that ESCOM has no incentive really to close down the coal power plants. They know that that supply is always going to be there. Um, Gwede is very happy to facilitate that. Um, and it's also reflected in the way in which he approaches policies, um, some of which you know, I don't really want to talk about here because then we're going to talk about the mind charter and then we're going to But yes, I think there's a very clear, um, there's a very clear relationship between the private and the regulator in, in, in the way in which the, the energy framework functions. And the, the last thing I'll say also is that Say what you want about Mr. Mandashe, but he did inherit a, a, a department that is an excellent example of state capture as a culture within government. Um, the way in which Mr. Benzi Zwagne's own uh, misconduct has been put in the spotlight does not end with him, and it was something that at least I saw was prevalent at the national departmental level, it was prevalent in the regional offices, it was prevalent down to the guy who's going to like buzz me in, like, can I get a fancy or something so you can come in, like, bro. <laughs> um, so the, the, the attitude of everyone needs to get a piece of the pie and why we're doing this work is completely irrelevant. Um, and that obviously is something that carries over into the DMRE that we have now and in the way in which it engages with private and uh, corporate companies. Yeah. Thanks very much, Lutanda. I think the, what you said also prompted something else in my mind, which is that the other area in which often the regulatory bodies or the state bodies and the private companies are united in their interest is to lobby against any law that would affect emissions or accountability in any way. And so if you look at the single biggest uh, contributors to rejecting or lowering the carbon tax in South Africa uh, and undermining two pieces of legislation, it is the Mineral Council, it's Business Unity South Africa, it's SASL, it is um, Anglo-American, SAR 32, all of those organizations are united in their design to slow things down as much as possible. That is a global experience. If you look at the United States, pro-fossil fuel lobbyists outspend the other side 27 to 1 in terms of their ability to lobby and push back against any kind of law that would impact uh, climate change, energy, and any of those things. And so we have to be frank that the battle also is, is a very difficult one. Uh, I am aware that, that Kumi is now online and listening to us, and so I'm going to, Abby, I'm going to ask you one final question 
for now before we hand over to me. And that is, you know, you work very much on the renewables chapter in this report. Um, and, and Zen's already hinted at it, but in terms of uh, the transition, however quick it is, what were the kind of big risks that you were seeing in terms of how that is currently happening in the renewable energy space in South Africa? So, I'll mention two. Um, the first comes back to what we've seen in, in, in coal, uh, in oil and gas as well, and it's, it's this this pattern of monopoly, right? So, at the moment, um, in the last in the last bit round window of REAP, um, and just to clarify, our report specifically focuses on large scale renewables. Um, but in in the last bit window, which is bit window six, um, I think about you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think about six projects were awarded, and about two companies had the majority of those projects as well. And this comes from a long line of, of monopolization that we've been seeing within uh, the REAP program as well, right? Some of the main company, like some of the big companies that are involved in it, for example, mainstream renewables, right? They made up about 15% of, you know, the generation that came from the REAP program. Um, but they are not a local company. They created a local company to be able to be a part of the REAP program, but actually they're headquartered in Dublin, and they are this huge international uh, renewable investment firm. Right. We see a similar pattern with Enel Green Power, as well, um, headquartered in Italy. Um, they have about 12, I don't know, 12, 14 uh, projects from REAP as well. Um, and this comes from a part of our government clearly pushing for investment particularly in, in, in oil and gas, right? And because of that, investment that has to come from rails has to come from outside. The PCC mentioned that for there to be a proper investment plan into a justition, it would cost in the first five years, it costs us about 150 billion rand. And it is very evident that that money isn't really at the moment from local companies. It is coming coming from international countries and international firms. So that's the that's the one risk. Uh, the second risk is what does this mean when we say that our just transition to Africa is going to be people-centered? Right. What does it actually mean for people who are in these towns where these projects are being created? For the people who don't have electricity, literally the everyday person, right? What does that mean? And what we see in the sector at the moment is this incredibly complicated ownership structure. It is very difficult to understand. I mean, I, I researched this and I was struggling. Um, you have an investment firm, then you have, you know, the company that provides the engineering, then you have the company that provides the money, and you have that other company that's also doing something, but you don't know what, you know, it's it's incredibly obscure. But an important element of the reprogram is this idea that we have to empower communities. And one of the important compliance measures to actually get a project and be awarded a project is to create a community trust. And at the moment, what we've seen with trust in the real energy sector is that they are as obscure as the sector itself. We don't know how the finances work. Um, some, sometimes the communities aren't consulted. Uh, sometimes the police aren't necessarily benefiting the communities in the way that they want to. But there, there are also examples of, of firms that have been successful in creating community trust well and, and providing um, a couple that's pretty good, um, but global. But in saying that, when we look at community ownership being a community trust, that financial mechanism is financial asset, right? That's meant to provide a benefit to these communities. It's incredibly complicated. And you don't necessarily understand how those factors are going to go back into a community the community that makes sense. And as we've seen in state capture, trusts have been used as fronts as well. 
that this is something that's seen in our context. And that's, that's a huge risk as well. Thanks, Abby. I, I was just thinking as you were saying that, I don't know if it Red Rock was the, one of the examples that you were thinking of, but just I'm looking at that, the renewable energy describes itself as an African independent power. But as far as we could tell, it's, it's owned by an investment fund called Evolution, mm -hmm. which belongs to the, uh, the British Internet, um, to the British Development Corporation, or what used to be the British corporation the fund is owned by the British, but it's domiciled in mauritius and in turn the day-to-day -day management is done by an investment firm and so this is where you do but you go kind of full circle and i suppose abby your point is roughly made is that in that kind of setup this increasingly globalized world where are the efforts flowing right particularly financially i think it's such a difficult question to unpick really important to follow and and on that note uh to switch over to our virtual participant this evening. Um, so, as I said, Kumi Naidu is joining us from the US uh, this evening. This evening for us, this morning for him. I'm going to try and give a very abridged uh, for Kumi because he has a, a, a very long and impressive bio. And many of you will know him. He's a dedicated South African human rights and environmental justice activist, uh, former Secretary General of Africa. International and also was the first person from the global south uh, to head Green Greenpeace International. He's currently a senior advisor for the Community Arts Network, and one of the reasons he's joining from the US is that he is also the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Center on Democracy and the Rule of Law. Uh, more recently, uh, he is the author of Let My Mother: The Makings of a Troublemaker, uh, a memoir that won nonfiction of the year from the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences. And, and on the topic of being a troublemaker, I, I raised earlier today, but very prominently, Kuhn was one of the activists earlier this year who were very publicly uh, thrown out of banks head off uh, during a protest around what we've described as uh, ongoing investment in fossil projects. Uh, Kuhn, thank you so much much again uh, for joining us this evening and uh, give your time. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, greetings everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. So first, I'd really like to start by saying a very big word of gratitude to uh, Open Secrets for the important report that you have actually just completed it is much needed timely uh, and hopefully will have the impact that is needed at this critical moment uh, i think open secrets role and the continued efforts in uncovering crimes and human rights violations especially in the in the private sector is critically needed right now i think it's important though for us to recognize that the challenges that we are seeing in South Africa are not challenges that are unique to us. It's part of a global uh, uh, reality that we face. If we look at what the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009 meant and exposed, as did COVID, it showed that we have a fundamentally broken economic system and a fundamentally broken governance system, and that the collusion between powerful interests in government and in the private sector are uh, what is actually ensuring that we don't really have meaningful democracy where the voices of ordinary people are actually factored into the decision making that we actually need to create a just, equitable and sustainable world. So if you look at what was the approach of governments around the world, including the South African government, after the global financial crisis. The approach was all about system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. But what was needed then and what's needed even more urgently in the moment that we find ourselves in is system innovation, system transformation, and system redesign. In many countries around the world, what we see is that, in fact, the energy sector, the corporate interests in that sector are actually controlling many governments. You know, if you take, for example, the Iraq war, uh, which 
the U.S. called Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, rumor has it that, in fact, originally it was called Operation Iraqi Liberation, uh, which if you put that uh, in an acronym spells oil, and somebody said, no, let's not be too obvious about it. Uh, so the energy sector has always had a disproportional amount of influence over governmental decision making because energy is seen as a national resource and so on. So when we look at why today governments and their allies in the fossil fuel industry are so resistant to change, uh, there is one way, when all the science is saying we need to move in, another, in, in, in a different direction, when our governments have signed on to uh, agreements at the global level, whether it's through the COP or other negotiating processes, which where they, they recognize, they don't disagree with us any longer that we are in a deep climate crisis, right? With the exception of Donald Trump, virtually every other major political leader does not seek to deny the reality of climate change, but why do they stick to it? And here's my simple answer to it, that the supply chain of corruption in fossil fuel projects, because of its scale, because of its complexity and so on, the supply chain of corruption is much more juicier, much more bigger, much more tempting. And what we have to recognize is that driving all of this is the fact that we have far too few centralized monopolies that control this very, very important sector. And when we look at the situation in South Africa right now, I don't want to suggest to you that there will not be corruption in the renewable energy sector. I mean, one of the things that I think we must give credit to the ANC for is that they have shown that they are extremely talented in maximizing corruption. So. I do not think that ANC uh, operatives at different levels will not, as they did with the COVID money, would not actually be able to corrupt in some ways the renewable energy rollout. But the scale of that, because of the fundamental decentralized nature of renewable energy production and provision, uh, limits the scale of what corruption we can have. So then we have to also recognize that the attacks that civil society in South Africa and climate activists in particular have been facing when we, for example, have um, Minister Gwede accusing those that actually stand up for what our government has signed on to in terms of global uh, agreements of being CIA agents is highly problematic. It's also problematic because it's not simply a question of corruption and stealing our children and their children's futures. It's also about the impact of that collusion between our government and big interests in the corporate sector. If we take the case of what's been happening in the Transkei with the Australian mining company there, you know, where we've seen uh, activists being killed, um, we need to recognize that that collusion is leading to fundamental human rights abuses, including the question of people losing their lives. And ask yourself the question, why is it that nobody seems to be found and held accountable for the murders of those activists that are happening? And so today, I want to be blunt about it. Today, the ANC looks less and less as a legitimate political party it looks more and more like a grand scale criminal enterprise. And we need to not be apologetic about calling that out because there is criminal collusion. A state capture is criminal collusion between powerful interests in the political class. And, and by the way, I don't want to suggest that this disease of criminality of our politics is the exclusive domain of the ANC, we have seen others uh, as well in the political class who actually engage in a similar way. Now, if we look at just two examples, if we look at uh, Recon Africa, 
which is a Canadian company operating out of uh, Namibia, for example, and how they collude in ways in which they put the lives of activists at risk, but how they actually take us in a high carbon direction. We need to recognize that there is, to fight the struggle, we need to be smart with regard to recognizing the global um, components to it and to recognize that actually in some of these countries, I want to give you a quick example of Sweden. Sweden has an energy company called Vattenfall, which in Sweden itself is doing really reasonably okay in terms of how they deliver energy. Most of it is through what we largely call clean energy. However, Vattenfall has major coal projects in Germany and Netherlands, for example. So the reason that they do that is because they do have vulnerability in their population. So, for example, if we take the struggle of the people in the Transkai with regard to um, the Australian company, uh, we need to recognize that sometimes to fight that struggle, it's also about building solidarity with progressives in Australia and go after them at the source of where the money ultimately is going to end up with. Then when we think about the just transition, I'm sad to say that already it's clear that what resources that will come for the just transition efforts are also going to be uh, subject to looting and corruption, and we need to be very vigilant. Uh, as I conclude, I just want to go to the recommendations that are made in this report by Open Secrets, and I just want to give some reflections on the five points. Firstly, the first thing on follow the money. I think it's critically important that we recognize that the situation we find ourselves in with us already at 1.2 degrees, and then the science says we need to be below 1.5 degrees, and already at 1.2 degrees, we're seeing the kind of climate impacts across the African continent, that we don't really have time anymore to go and fight every oil, coal, and gas company. We got to follow the money and shut the flow of capital at source. And that is why the actions of Standard Bank and other banks in South Africa must be challenged. We have to recognize that today, most of our energies in terms of where we push has to go to the world of finance. Because if we can shut the flow of capital and push financial institutions not to lend to oil, coal, gas, deforestation, or other economic activity that takes us closer and closer to the climate cliff, unless we're able to do that, sadly, I don't believe we have a chance, given the timeline and how small the window of opportunity is, and it's closing for us to ensure that we are not going down the direction of what the science calls irreversible, catastrophic, runaway climate change. On the second uh, proposal on greater transparency, transparency is the biggest tool we have. If people are made aware of exactly what is happening, how um, governments are abusing the power and so on, that gives us the best chance for us to hold power to account, both corporate power as well as political power. But I just want to say, yeah, those of us who are fighting the struggle must learn to to speak like human beings. <laughs> we tend to use a language and facts and figures and so on, which actually generally goes way above the heads of the majority of our people. And therefore, it's critical that in our activism today, we don't simply aim all of our narratives at trying to shift the head through facts, figures, scientific reports, policies, and so on. We have to take into account that people are moved into action if we can touch them in the arts and in, in the heart. And therefore, one of the areas that I've been putting a lot of my energies into is what we call energizing artivism, which is bringing the worlds of arts, culture, and activism together so that we are able to resonate with people's cultures and multiple cultural realities and not think that we are going to be able to shift people by sharing a you know a massive scientific report for example and think people are going to be shifting on recommendation c which is 
the third one on dismantling monopolies. This is absolutely critically necessary. The reality is that the climate crisis is with us. It's going to be with us for a long time, and it might actually be catastrophic, and we might be on a suicidal trajectory. However, if you think about it, if we do not believe, build decentralized, resilient economic systems and energy systems, uh, we don't have a chance to actually be able to address the crisis in the way that we need to. So, for example, when some of us were being dismissed 15 years ago when we were saying, let's turn every home, every school, every education institution, every business, every place of worship into two things, an electricity generator by maximizing solar panel distribution, but also, secondly, an income generator. In many countries around the world today, you have a situation where people can feed their excess energy into the grid and get a compensation for it. ESCOM does not then need to run stupid adverts saying to people, use less electricity. You have to build an incentive on why people should actually uh, use less electricity. And if they were enabled to actually have access to decentralized solar, uh, rooftop solar on scale, then you are building into it an incentive of why people can actually uh, want to be able to use electricity in more efficient ways. On the fourth recommendation on regulation and accountability for loss and damage, uh, yeah, I would say that, you know, when we went to Egypt for the COP, um, many of us didn't think that we would get the global north. Uh, and by the way, let's just be very clear. When we say global north and global south, what we are talking about is the global minority versus the global minority. And yes, we did not get the action that we want, but the fact that finally after decades of fighting for loss and damage, we got that into the negotiations is an important step forward. However, we need to now take the loss and damage stuff at the global level and nationalize it and think about which companies today and which banks are funding the further destruction and, and, and try to find ways to actually get them to account. But let's be very clear. If we think in the next election, if the ANC continues to have the dominance that it has, and if we don't have some new thinking and new political forces coming in, if you look at the policy of the ANC, they're going to continue to, on the one hand, say, yes, we're very concerned about climate change, but in practice, they're going to continue to roll out uh, gas and oil projects, as we know, across our coastline, for example. The last recommendation is listen to people, not corporations. Or another way of saying it is listen to the people, not the polluters. And right now, when we're thinking about the just transition, I would just end on this point that it's critically important that we don't only reduce the question of the just transition, importantly, to the workers that work in those industries. They should not be punished. They should be retrained for new jobs in a renewable energy sector. If they are close to retirement, they should get proper compensation uh, you know, and pensions and so on. But we have to think, as some of the wonderful speakers that I was listening to just now were alluding to, we have to think about the communities around those fossil fuel infrastructure, the people who sell uh, uh, food and so on. And that's critically uh, important for us to make sure that we think about not just the workers in the industry, which is how the conversation is happening in the global north. We have to think about how do we have just transitions for the entire communities that have become dependent, not through the fault of their own, on fossil fuel infrastructure. Let me just end by saying that uh, we cannot change the science. We All we can change is political will. And thankfully, political will in meaningful democracies is a renewable uh, uh, resource. And we have to take the coming elections very seriously. And I know it's stacked against us, but we have to think about how we end up with a different configuration of political forces that actually enable us and give us a chance to address the climate crisis and the intersecting crisis. And very lastly, I, I would say, 
we must not think that the climate crisis is a crisis that stands on its own. And we have to, in the way we approach things moving forward, is to turbocharge intersectionality in our thinking, in our planning, and in our execution of everything that we do. Thank you so much for accommodating me from this long distance away from home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kumi, for the for the input and for joining us. As I said, I, I think you think about you've already kind of answered one of the questions that I was gonna have for you, which is about it's something that came up in the open secrets office today, is how to balance the reality of the facts of the seriousness of the climate crisis and what it means if the world hits a two or a three degree world and how utterly depressing that reality is with the necessity of to offer a, a different way and a transformational way about thinking about those things. Um, and I think the way that is, is incredibly helpful. Um, this audience has now been here for a long time and hasn't had a chance to say anything. And so I think that this is uh, the perfect time to open it up uh, for input uh, questions. There are a couple of colleagues who will be going around with, with microphones for you. Um, uh, please just introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from before you, you speak. We do have uh, about 25 minutes, so as, as much as is possible, please try and keep it uh, reasonably brief. And if it's directed at someone, please uh, please do point that out. Um, take your hands and look around the room. Liz, yes. Hi, this is McDade from Green Connection. So I, I, I just want to say, well done. I mean, amazing to get all this into a book that you can read. Um, so, and I think you managed to not be too technical, and it is readable. So, so I, I think well done. Um, and I also think having lived through a couple of decades of this, <laughs> that uh, it, it really does bring it home that whether you're talking about nuclear or oil or gas or coal, it's just one huge corrupt mess. Um, and if you think about, you know, those many decades of putting in place systematic corruption, um, it's going to be very difficult to undo. So I just had a couple of points is, is the Department of Minerals and Energy was at some point split off because minerals should be very different to energy but it was brought back together again. And to me, that was quite deliberate to ensure that energy was very much tied to our fossil minerals. So I just wondered what your thoughts were. And then the other issue is just around this just and unjust transition. And this is just a, a comment is we're working on the coast and for example, the West Coast where fishers um, who have been marginalized continuously um, are, are now have to make their livelihoods off the sea. And the offshore oil and gas is being seen as this transition. And obviously we're fighting the oil and gas, but the issue is this just transition is often looked at as simply the coal, and as you rightly say, the communities and the workers. And, but what about those who are now, were, are going to, whose lives are going to be more unjust because of this transition. And that also applies to renewable energy projects where people are dislocated and Bukhubai and green hydrogen. So I just wanted some reflection on that. But well done, guys. Thanks. I'm looking for chapter, book two coming out soon. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Ali Osgar. I'm from Open Cities Lab. Uh, thanks so much. and. Uh, just echoing the sentiments there that uh, this is a very good report. It's rare to see a report that looks nice, so well done. Um, so my question, I guess, is about the how. And um, the first part is how, how do we make our voices heard in this space, right? So you spoke about all these injustices that are happening. You spoke about all the challenges that affect us. So how, do, how does a person get their voices heard in this space. 
And the second one is how do you get this information um, to everyday people? I guess one way is this report, but I assume not every person would read this report. So how, how do we make people realize the impact that what you have said is having on them? As an example, I always go to pick and pay and the teller always wants so eager to give me a plastic bag. And I always wonder that if she gives me a plastic bag or he gives me a plastic bag, the impact that that is having to the environment, do they know this? And I always want to think about how do I inform them about this? How do I make it relevant to them, right? Um, and that's the big question. How will the majority of people know about the impact that all that you have said will have on them? And how can they prevent it? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so let's let's have an opportunity to respond, but also can we just note let on all of those two hands for, for the next round? Um, I'm just checking in, Kumi, can you hear everything that's happening in this room? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Because I <laughs> that's great. So I'm gonna come back to you very soon. Um, Lutando, not to throw you under the bus, but being our DMRE expert, I was wondering <laughs> if you had anything in particular on that question about the merging of mineral resources and energy. Absolutely. Um, and it's a great question. Hi, hi Liz. Um, yeah, so we, we saw the, the splitting, the coming together, splitting, coming together of that. Um, and some of that happened under um, Zuma's presidency, some of it happened under Ramaphosa's presidency. And I think you hit the nail on the head in the structural representation of a fundamental relationship between fossil fuels and energy in South Africa. Um, and it, I think I did touch on this a little bit earlier that our private corporations, our mining companies, our, um, their lawyers, their accountants, everybody, they are all working towards um, the same goal, which is to say one thing and to do another. Um, and, and we see that, you know, at, at, at the smallest legislative level um, and we see it at the highest profitable level. Um, one of the main critiques that usually comes from the minerals councils and other private corporations in the energy sector is that the way in which our regulatory framework is set up is overzealous. It is something that uh, discourages foreign investment, and it's part of the reason why we're seeing an economic decline in South Africa. It could not be further from the truth. Um, and that reasoning was part of the so-called um, rationale for merging DMR with the Department of Energy again um, as a way to try and re-incentivize foreign investment and as a way to try and make the regulatory framework more streamlined, right? Instead of having multiple regulators, you have one regulator. The legislation hasn't changed though. Um, and in any case, the legislative amendments that we're seeing are very foreign investment friendly. Um, all you have to do is set up a really nice shelf company at SIPSI, call it uh, CIA, and then, and then, and then go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have that answer to question. <laughs> it's giving Prasa a flashback. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks very much, Lutano. Um, Abhi and Zen, I do want to come back to you now on some of these other questions, but Kumi, I was hoping to bring you in, in particular, on the second question around how do we make our voices heard. I, I know you touched on this already in your response, but I think it is for the forefront of many of our minds, exactly as you say, is how do we go from having the information, some of which is often quite devastating, understanding the full extent and, and the risks that we're facing, you know, how do we take that forward and, and what does what is our active what does successful activism look like in that space? Um, if you'll permit me to do a small anecdote in answering that question, right? Please. Uh, I found myself in 2011 on a little inflatable boat going to occupy an oil rig in the Greenlandic Arctic, and my colleagues on the boat could see that I was very scared because I don't swim very well. And uh, and they uh, they said to me, no, don't worry, Kumi, if you fall in uh, with what you're wearing, you'll survive at least two hours and you won't be dead from hypothermia. And I had this horrible thought, looking at the poster that I was carrying, which said, stop Arctic destruction. I had this terrible thought that if this was the last action for justice that I was going to be engaging in, 
that 99.99% of my family, my friends, my comrades on the African continent wouldn't understand what that slogan actually was, right? Because at that time, I think now more people recognize that the Arctic is a sort of refrigerator or air conditioner for the planet. And if the Arctic sea ice melts as much as it does, then it has a very negative impact. Uh, I spent a short time in prison, about a week. I get back home a couple of weeks later, and a young person in my family says to me, Uncle Kumi, what a stupid slogan, stop Arctic destruction. That meant absolutely nothing to anybody. So I said, okay, darling, tell me what would be a better slogan. And she said, save Santa Claus now. <laughs> but think about the brilliance. Think about the brilliance of what she was saying. She was saying, you folks, you activists, you'll project your consciousness on us, right? And you'll are not starting with where our consciousness is. And she was saying, basically, if the majority of people in Africa, the only connection with the Arctic is that Santa Claus is chilling there for most of the year, then, uh, then, then connect with that reality. Just as an aside, I told the story when I addressed the German parliament in a breakfast thing in 2021, and I had a German MP come up to me and say, uh, Kumi, I hope, do you know that Santa Claus doesn't actually really exist? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do know Santa Claus doesn't exist. But my point is, we have to de-intellectualize how we communicate with people. And let's look at our history in South Africa where the majority of the worst legacy of apartheid was leaving the majority of our people unable to read and write, right? And so during the struggle, we used song, dance, street theater, uh, and that was in a world pre-social media and pre the kind of tools that we actually have available, you know, whether it's Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and so on. And I think some of the, and, and if I think about even the slogans of that time, I grew up in Durban and, you know, even framing slogans that connects with people, right? You know, there were lots of slogans, of course, every now and then the middle class domination of our movements. You'll have people saying, you know, resist the constitutional, you know, the, the, the tricameral constitution, for example, and all of that. But the slogan that really resonated as a young activist in Durban was just, you know, one Zulu word which said Asina Mali, you know, we do not have money, right? And and that was one of the most powerful organizing slogans that um, moved us forward. Now, I don't want to suggest that to communicate the crisis of climate change is easy. It is challenging, it's difficult, and so on. But I want to believe that there's enough creativity amongst the kinds of people that are sitting in that room and uh, today to be able to get us to a point where we are able to move uh, you know, things forward. And I'll just end with saying that with the report that you'll have done, what do we do with it, right? The report as it is, and, and it's it's very accessible for people who have literacy capabilities, right? And that's great because we need a report that pushes in the policy spaces and in the amongst the middle class because the middle class then are able to to resonate those messages because they are the ones who have are not suffering from time poverty because understand that the majority of our people are suffering from terrible time poverty, right? They don't have the time to engage with things. They just suffering with survival, right? So that's a good first step. Then I think the second thing is looking at how do we frame things and communicate things in manageable, sizable bites that actually can reach people. So right now, if, if, if open secrets had a communications budget, right, I would, you know, or, or, or I would say, let's get a song or a couple of songs that communicate the message of what's in that report. Let's get a couple of dances that actually kind of get people communicating that uh, the message of the report. Let's try and think about theat 
theater, let's get our artists engaged and so on, and keep it as simple. I'm not saying be simplistic, but keep it as accessible as we can. And, and let me ask a, conclude by asking a question here, right? To everybody in the room. How many of you can put up your hands with confidence and answer to this question? Are you able to communicate what we've been discussing in this event today with your, your parents, your friends, not your close friends, because your close friends are probably in the same movements as you, but how many of you would be able to have conversations with your parents, your uncles, your aunties, uh, cousins, and so on? about the content of this report and the conversation that we've had and that they understand it. Because if I'm brutally honest, I try really hard myself to make sure that I do this. And, and maybe if I can just end on a, on a personal note. As some of you know, uh, one of the things I've been working on with my family is the setting up of the Ricky Rick Foundation for the promotion of artivism. And I want to say that in my last face-to-face -face conversation with Ricky, he actually said something that was very troubling in January of last year, uh, sorry, January of 2022, when he said, you know, he said to his mom, Louisa and I, guys, you're really useless at your work. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, Listen, you've been fighting for gender equality, democracy, for environmental justice, and so on. And all these agendas appear to be going in the wrong way. And your problem is you are not able to communicate with people where you can reach them in the hearts and move them into action. And I think that that is the challenge for us right now. We have to be able to de-intellectualize what we are saying, make it manageable, in terms of the volume of what we're asking people to process and to try and crystallize, you know, what we are saying in small bites so people can absorb it. And I'll just end with what I learned from the Pacific. In 2015, uh, on this 1.5 degrees, when I was in the Pacific from various Pacific Island countries, I learned a new slogan, which said, 1.5 to stay alive. 1.5 to stay alive and it really moved me i'm not saying that that solves the problem but even using something like that which getting people to actually understand that your the survival of humanity depends on that and it's forcing people to then try and find more and by the way six months later when i met those same folks at the climate negotiations in paris the new slogan was 1.5 we might survive 1.5 we might survive so i think it's it's really about accessible language and and the last the last thing i would say is also fun right i mean if we make activism and 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 so on as something that is oh my god we have to go to another meeting we have to go to another rally and so on we have to make climate activism and activism generally much more sexy than it is right now we have to make it something that people, that people feel, I want to be involved in it. You know, there's, there's excitement in it. And I think we ignore not doing that at our own peril and continuing to talk to ourselves in ever small silos where we convince ourselves how passionate we are and how important it is, but we're not able to move the large numbers of people that we critically need to move. Thank you, and I'm sorry if my answer was a bit too long. No, thank, thank you so much, Kumi. And you can't see everyone in the room, but you should have seen the excitement in the Open Secrets colleagues when you mentioned a song and a dance. Uh, it looks like a deeply popular idea, so it, it may well be coming out soon. Um, um, I just wanted to say something. I want to yeah, I want to answer Kumi's question. All right, so... I'm from George. I know you're probably like, where is that? But it's a small, it's a small town in, in the Garden Roots. And in 2018, there was a, a, a huge drought, right? Um, 
So <laughs> the, my cousin, she is a cashier at ShopRite, right? And ShopRite is on this huge, we support renewables, we support the environment run, right? So she is a cashier at, um, at ShopRite. And <laughs> so during that drought, the, the government, well, the, municip the Georgia municipality's response to that was often slow when it came to black and colored communities. And my cousin was struggling to get water. And when she went to ShopRite, her boss, was, you know, her bosses who say that they support renewable energy and the environment and all these things. And when they protested and asked, you know, for assistance financially, they were, de they were denied, right? And my cousin, who many wouldn't consider an intellectual, came back and said, this is wrong. This is wrong. We don't have water and we don't have money to get water. This doesn't make sense. And she said those words to ShopRite. So let's not, I just don't want us to create a dangerous idea that there are communities in our country who do not understand what global climate change is, they do. And then <laughs> on the other question regarding, um, I think it was the question on what does renewables, like what happens when communities aren't able to, to, to gain access and justice to what happens in the transition, right? I wanna, I wanna read out this quote because I think it is incredibly powerful. And it's an excerpt from an open letter from the Coastal Links Eastern Cape Amadiba Crisis Committee and Dweza Tweba Communal Property Association. And they were responding to Minister Gwede Mantashe and Minister Barbara Creasy's uh, accusations that, you know, um, this idea that environmental activism is the CIA, it is just white environmentalists. And this comes from directly from this open letter. So it says in the report, Blaming white environmentalists to us is a demonstration of your arrogance and unwillingness to listen to us. The people of the coast, the people of Port St. John's, of Stain, of Dwesetwebe, of Tolobeni, of Amatole region. It also saddens us as it makes us think that you believe that we are unable to think or decide for ourselves how we wish our communities to be developed. Your insult is if your insult, you insult us if you imply that this is only their struggle. This is all of our struggle. The sea is our great home. It is the source of all life and is a sacred place. And it is the home of many of our ancestors. We are angry that you dare question our beliefs and our choices. We ask you to respect our culture, our lives, and our livelihoods and protect the future of all. People understand. Thank you so much, Abby. Uh, there were two hands uh, that were up, I think, over there and over there. Um, can they please go next? Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Pozisa. So I just want to find out, I heard we spoke about the Paris Agreement, and I understand that in terms of the just energy transition, that there was an amount of $8.5 billion that was... Um, allocated towards the Just Energy Transition Project. And I think my question is, if then South Africa does not adhere to the agreed upon things, um, what then? And also the fact that I understand that Germany um, has been decommissioning some of their wind farms to expand coal of which we understand that Germany was the same country that was supporting um, this Paris Agreement for us to um, limit our, coal limi uh, our um, carbon emissions. So now it's creating a, a contrast because now like, what are we doing ultimately? <laughs> like, what are we actually saying? And also I just want us um, to get to the point because I understand that South Africa or Africa as a whole in terms of our carbon emissions compared to countries like the US, Germany, um, 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 India, et cetera, our carbon emissions are far lower, like 3% the entire continent. 
So I think maybe from my um, standpoint, I just want to understand from that point of view. And also, in the, I know that Komati was um, decommissioned, Komati Power Station in Bumalanga, which set back the community there. So this was supposed to bring transition, but how is it that now it's creating havoc in that community because of um, mismanagement of, of this entire thing? And just lastly, I understand that there are other alternatives like nuclear. We have a nuclear power plant, um, ESCOM nuclear power plant here in um, Cape Town, which gives 5% um, capacity in our country and it's been running for the past 39 years safely so less carbon emissions like less to none actually so are we looking at things like that and like what message are we passing out there that's it for me and then i just i just want to know that um, is this problem run by the government or by public companies? Mm. Um, thank you very much. And then, sorry, please go ahead and then we'll, we'll take some answers. Okay. Um, hi everyone. My name is Tino. Um, I work as a climate change consultant. So this was very interesting topic for me. Um, I think I have a comment and a question, and I think my first comment would be just to address this idea of a just transition, because I feel like it's a term that's thrown around very loosely and can apply to multiple issues, specifically in South Africa. And I remember when I was studying environmental law, my lecturer asked us, what, how would you define a just transition? And it was something that was very difficult for the class to answer because what does it actually mean? And if we're centering people in this just transition, how are we, how are we actually going about centering people in it, right? So there's this idea that we need to decentralize information, but within, the, within trying to facilitate the just transition, there hasn't been as much effort to decentralize information at a local level. So the thing is, and in my experience with the work that I've done, people know about climate change. People can articulate that the growth season has changed. People can articulate that the fish stocks are a lot less. People know that information, but what do we do to empower people with that knowledge in trying to achieve a just transition? Um, I think that's something that I've always struggled with. And then my second question, or yeah, question kind of relates to what you said about um, the loans that South Africa has received to move away from coal. And ultimately, when we're talking about how we have these private companies that are facilitating or enabling the growth of coal production or the growth of the use of coal, where do these loans to move to green energy fit in? Because I think it's, we've seen what happens with loans before from the World Bank, from the IMF, and we've seen how money is handled in this country. So when there is kind of this declaration of, oh, South Africa has received this amount of money to move away from coal, where does it fit in when we have these huge private companies that want to drive a certain agenda, when we have Greta Mantashe who thinks it's anti-development to move in the other direction? Yeah, where do those loans mm -hmm. fit in? Thank you so much. Um, it is, it's five past eight. So what, I, what I'm gonna suggest is, uh, Lutanda, we're gonna start with you, <laughs> sorry, uh, and just move down. And I think what, if you could answer anything in particular that you wanna address from the three questions that have come up uh, and use it as an opportunity also to get out anything you've been really wanting to say. Sure. Um, and then as I said at the beginning, so everyone including Kumi will have a last chance to address some of these issues. As I said, though, we will continue the discussion after this, uh, so there'll be some refreshments. Um, and so please, if you do have a question that you haven't been able to ask, and you want to engage the panel further, please do stick around uh, after that. But uh, Lutando, do you want to kick us off? Okay. 
Um, I wanted to address your question, Tino, about um, decentralizing information. I think it's such an important point, and it goes to, um, you know, one of the points in our in, in our report where we recommend that transparency is fundamental for accountability. Um, some of the work that we're doing now post this report is sending promotion of access to information applications and requests to government entities, SOEs, um, your key players within the energy mix. Um, and one could say that, you know, when we have that information, what do we do with it? But information is power, right? And we want to know what the terms of our crisis are. We're being sold out. I'd like to know exactly how and for how long and how much money is at stake. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that point about um, information is something that we can never say is like undervalued. As much information as we can get in order for us to be able to articulate what a just transition is better is always going to be fundamental for us to eventually get accountability down the line. Um, and then I wanted to answer Max's really important question because it kind of touches on the question that was asked earlier. So. You asked, who, who is it? Is it government? Is it public? Is it, is it companies? Um, it's kind of everybody. <laughs> um, but I want to say that I think the question is important because some, someone asked a question earlier about how do I explain to someone that buying plastic bags is like bad? Yes, obviously buying plastic is bad. But what we do, what you do when you buy a toy or when we buy whatever it is, can never be the same as the way in which the big government companies and the big public companies and the big private companies do to contribute to our climate crisis. The, the, the burden of fixing this is not at our doorstep. It is at the doorstep of the biggest polluters our multinational companies, our governments, their collusion between each other. Yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> and thanks, I'm thanks uh, Abby, go ahead. Um, I think I'll speak to the question on what happens if we don't meet our international agreements, right? Because this was a question Lutanda and I were, were kind of grappling with earlier as well. So with the Paris, with the Paris agreement in particular, um, right, it, it's an internationally binding agreement, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't meet the targets, correct me if I'm wrong, Lutanda, right? Please, I know you're the lawyer. I'm just, yeah, I'm just spitballing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be actual legal, right, consequences if you don't meet those targets, um, which kind of brings into question, okay, so if we do get, for example, the eight billion, eight billion like investment from from these international agreements, you know, who and what is going to make sure that that money is actually used for the just transition and why? And I don't know the answer to that question. And maybe I will in ten or twenty years when the Earth will still be here. <laughs> but will we? <laughs> no, but. I don't know the answer to that question, but it is something that is incredibly important for us to think through. And in terms of, I think there was another point raised about, you know, the global North countries like Germany are going back to this uh, idea of investing in coal and not actually um, prioritizing renewable energy. It just goes to show that where there is money, there is absolutely no hesitation for the powerful to continue profiting off of it. And this is really scary because it's something that our own government as well, you know, is also in its own way kind of doing as well, going back and not decommissioning the coal stations, um, not providing as sustainable financial investment structures for our re renewable uh, sector as well. And yeah, I just thought that was a really important point as well that you raised there. Um, I don't have anything else to add. Thanks, Abby. Zen? Zen's microphone is on. <laughs> thanks, Levano. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Levano. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I was, I was pretty covered 
uh, by Lutanda and Abby. So I, know. Um, I just have um, just a few things to add following on from that. I think, yeah, the, the big question of whose problem is, who is the problem here? I think uh, Lutanda covered that well. Is it government? Is it public? Um, and I think that's where I think, yeah, it's an important question. That's where we wanted to come in with this report is to say, um, often that is the lens through which the climate work and the climate crisis is viewed and engaged with. And um, there's, not that it's missing, but um, yeah, there's an opportunity here for us to spotlight the private sector actors who stay winning <laughs> regardless. Um, yeah, and I think that's the important thing from our history. Um, I think there was a question from Liz about, you know, um, minerals energy coming into one. Um, from its inception, um, they were linked. They are linked. And I think, um, yeah, I, you have the first mine, you know, the first diamonds and Kimberley being discovered. And then you have the first commercialization of coal being, you know, mined to facilitate more diamonds and more gold. Um, and so from inception, um, they were inextricably linked. And, and to, to separate them, I think, um, would be a good governance thing, uh, but didn't actually happen. The question of the just transition, important one. I think a lot of the conversation that has actually come up here tonight, interestingly enough, came up a lot internally, um, organizationally, as we were kind of thinking about how we step into the space, um, what is the conversation we want to have, what is the message we are trying to get across, um, and how do we do that, and what a just transition in fact is, was part of, yeah, lots of thinking and debating and internal grappling, um, and for us, we do take a stance in the report um, to say that for us, a just transition would essentially be, well, not without grappling, of course, um, but it would essentially be um, going green for greed, but not facilitating structural change um, or maintaining the status quo. So you can have just a transition <laughs> or a just transition. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, and that's, yeah. And I think, <laughs> okay, and then about the loans, yes, another, it's interesting, uh, an important question that we did grapple with again internally. So a huge group effort, this report, <laughs> with lots of grappling um, uh, with us internally um, and many big conversations. Uh, we do touch on that aspect in the report about um, so the fact that we have global north countries um, funding the jet IP is, is, I think, important. And it's, it's part of the debate about how do we address the fact that, you know, you had uh, the global north countries essentially being able to develop and industrialize without any terms and conditions, without any um, checks and balances. And the argument has, has been that is the reason not only, but a big one, why we are where we are. And now you are asking us, which is the debate that has been put by the government to kind of maintain things, but you know, um, and we do touch on that, is to say, why are you forcing us to, um, why are you putting developmental constraints when you are the reason we're in this? And one of the ways that the international community has tried to kind of, to grapple with that reality, because it is one, is to then say, yeah, well, essentially, that's true, we took your resources um, and industrialized our countries and polluted the planet and uh, you know, created a globally economic um, divided society. And now we are coming back to, to tell you what to do again. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and so I think one of the ways that um, the, the international community has tried to do, deal with that complexity and reality is to say, well, then you are the countries that are going to also have to put um, some money here um, to, to help the global south and countries to, to, um, to facilitate a, a transition. And so that's kind of um, one of the ways in which um, 
that can be argued is an important factor of it. What happens with the billions? Yes. Uh, <laughs> what happens with the billions is one of the things we say we need to keep a watching brief on, especially given our context, but not our context as in Global South is corrupt. Our context as in multinational corporations rule and govern the world, money follows that, and capital does the same. And so that is the context, not a corrupt Global South. And um, for us, that will be, I guess, to yeah, the importance of conversations like this and reports like this to do, to recommend that we need to have, um, yeah, to be vigilant um, and to seek accountability and to ensure that, to help try and ensure that, that that's a watching beef. Um, what happens? Where do people stand? What happens from here? Do people get it? Um, and where to next? I think... Abby, Lusano, and Kumi spoke to this, but um, we often have this conversation again internally about how do you navigate the space between knowing that a lot of people don't need you to come tell them what they already know because it's your lived reality in ways that um, are often unimaginable, unfathomable to someone whose reality that's not quite true for you, um, but also how do you decentralize complex, diff different conversations happening in different rooms um, in a way that allows conversation to happen that reaches people. And I think maybe the line that we often try to um, walk, that we do in this report, but often try to do in our work is to say, we try to be a bridge between um, some of the more complex conversations happening elsewhere and the lived reality. Not because they, they need each other necessarily, but because the conversation is similarly happening in different ways across the way, in ways that it's not talking to each other. And by being a bridge, um, we both try to say, here's the microphone. You say what you have to say. And I think that's why when we were thinking about this climate work, we thought a people's hearing on um, the climate crisis is something that uh, we are trying to launch next year um, as a follow on from this work is, is, is and it's, it's a model we've used um, in the past with our other work to say, this is, we're all having the same conversation. We're just not having them in the same rooms um, to each other. And so how can we do that? And yeah, um, just that's, that's what I think is important and what's, what's coming across as a, as a next step to this. Um, it's not just a report going into the ether. Um, so yeah. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, one minor correction. We're not, we're not trying to launch it. It's happening on the 31st of January. We can, uh, <laughs> put a date on it. So on the 31st of January next year, there will be a people's hearing uh, on the climate crisis held, uh, organized by Open Secrets and Partner Organizations being held at Community House around the corner in Salt River. And it will be one of the spaces where exactly as everyone said, it will be a space to speak through these issues, but also speak very deliberately to impact on communities. Um, and I think maybe, Tina, that goes to your point a little bit, which is that impact to all of those different communities, you know, people whose jobs are impacted, communities are around power stations, people who have, you know, have serious health, health repercussions from the emissions of coal and all those things. Um, the, the last thing I will say just in response to one of the questions before I hand over to, to Kumi to, for, for a kind of final word is that I think one of the things that we've grappled with with this report and that we always have to grapple with, which is your question, is, and Zen spoken to this, how do you deal with the hypocrisy of the global north? And I think one of the ways in which it's at least helpful to view the lens is that even if a whole range of European countries and others kind of reverse their commitments for often the same reasons, because those, those countries have long been captured by corporate interests, um, and it's exactly the same issue we have here. Even if that, that is true, it, it would not change the nature of the impact of, of these type of activities on South African people and, and South African communities. So 
if Europe goes back to coal, it doesn't, that doesn't change how much fishing communities on the wild coast will be impacted if Total is able to drill into the ocean floor and we risk massive methane blooms in the ocean and, and emissions of that nature. That will still be catastrophic here for people and it will only benefit our experience shows us those kind of corporate interests. And so I think the challenge for us is for us to try and acknowledge that hypocrisy while forging a way forward here that uh, that does it in our own way and deals with all these intersectional issues of justice and the, and the various crises that we face. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do, but uh, we have to hold that all at the same time. Um, and on that note, no, no pressure, Kumi, but if you can, uh, in a couple of minutes, give the, the final input, any last things that you haven't had the opportunity to say yet. Thank you very much. Um, following the three contributions we've just heard, I'm reminded of a moment during the anti-apartheid struggle. If you followed those, uh, you know, at the end of a panel like this, you said, most of the really good points I want to make have been eloquently made by the previous speakers. And then you said, however, for emphasis, and you spoke for like half an hour. So, so let me try and be brief and say um, the question that I think there were two questions that maybe it's worth saying a little more about. One is, you know, the reality is that we're not just dealing with climate change. We're dealing with climate injustice and the climate injustice is that the global north developed the energy system destroyed their ecological assets and so on and have given us this problem and so when we talk about the global north and the global south it's quite important that increasingly we must say the global minority versus the global majority because when we look about the countries that are constituting the global south, we are overwhelmingly, right, by far, you know, at least 60 to 70% of the world's population. The second thing is when we are saying to them that when, when we talk about the climate injustice, even though most of our people have not contributed to emissions, as one of the speakers said, and Africa is less than 4% of uh, emissions contribution at the moment. The sad reality, though, is that we are paying the first and most brutal price from climate change. It's our people that are dying in significant numbers. It's not to say that people in the global north are not being impacted, but they've got the resources and so on to minimize the number of deaths and so on. But when we look at what happened in Durban, um, you know, last year when we had a rain bomb and in two days more than close to 500 people lost their lives uh you know we can see the impacts are taking lives now and so we find ourselves in a very difficult situation when we see europe backsliding as our sister talked about coal in germany so yes what i would say we don't have the option we, we can't say oh because they are doing it we should continue to doing it when we are actually paying the most brutal prices. But what we've tried to do in the fights at a global level is to establish a principle of common and differentiated responsibilities that the all of us have to do certain things, whether from the north or the south, but the greater burden has to be on the global north that carries the responsibility. And part of what we've built into the system which is not working well, but we can continue to push for it, is in fact that the funding for the transitions that we need needs to come from the global north. So we established already in 2015, sorry, in 2009, the principle of a green climate fund, which is supposed to have the rich countries contributing 100 billion a year, right, to ensure that there's resources for countries in the global south to transition. And we must be very clear here. We're not asking them for charity. They don't deserve any praise for this money. This is basically them paying their climate debt. This is about redress for the systems they put in place and the systems by which they built their economy. So 
The last point was the point about nuclear, and I think it's just important not to leave it hanging in the room without a response. Um, so basically, uh, if um, President Zuma succeeded in moving forward his corrupt deal with Russia to build seven nuclear plants, if you think bads things are bad in South Africa, and if that deal would, was signed, we would be completely bankrupt by now. And let's be clear why today for South Africa and the African continent, nuclear is not the most, uh, is not a good option. And if I can put it simply, nuclear is too expensive, it's too dangerous, and as a solution to climate change, it will deliver too little too late, right? So when we look at the cost comparisons of to build a nuclear capability versus solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, and so on, the cost of any of those investments is significantly less and will deliver more. So from a cost point of view, nuclear is absolutely not something we should consider. And yes, it's true. We've not had any serious incidents of safety at uh, Kuberg, but assuming somebody from the nuclear industry came into the room and said, I can guarantee you all in the future there will never be any environmental catastrophic event like we saw in Japan in Fukushima with the tsunami, and we, we believed it. Assuming the person said, I can guarantee you there'll never be any uh, technological failures and assuming we believed it. If somebody comes and say, we can guarantee you there won't be any human error or there won't be any element of corruption that might create a problem, assuming we believed all of that. The one thing they cannot look at us with honesty and convince us is they cannot guarantee us what happens with the nuclear waste at the end of the nuclear cycle. You can guarantee you it's not going to be put in waterfall where Paul Mashetile lives. It's not going to be put in Kandla. It's not going to be put in Limpopo where Malema has its farm. It will be put in the poorest communities. And that constitutes a massive long-term danger. And that's a danger we don't need to put our people uh, under. And then in terms of how long it takes, when I say it'll deliver too little too late, is that to build a single nuclear plant, if everything works well, the fastest timeline you're talking is about seven to 10 years, right? For just a single plant. But we know that the history of building nuclear plants can take up to 30 years in some cases, especially when it's nuclear plants built by Russia or countries outside of their own countries. So for all of those reasons, I think it's critically important that we recognize that nuclear for South Africa is a false solution uh, when we have not maximized. We have not maximized solar, wind, and all the other technologies that we have available, and that's where we should be putting our energies. I'd like to just end by saying to... Uh, uh, I, I thank you, Abby, for your, your comment about making it clear that our people can see the impacts of climate change in their lives on a daily basis, especially in rural areas, but all over the country. The challenge, I think, of activism right now is how do we help people make the connection between the realities, the climate impacts they're facing in their lives, and the bigger transitions that we need to make from the causes of those, um, you know, what's causing that. Like, for example, in KZN, uh, I, I was helping to make a documentary called Temperature Rising uh, and, and went and spoke to people uh, there, you know, after the horrific flooding last year. And it was interesting. So many people were saying this has been so devastating for us, but they were not necessarily making a climate connection. And this might be very specific to KZN. They were saying, God is punishing us for the looting that took place the year before, right? And so part of what we need to be figuring it out is how do we 
communicate the causality and, and so on, and how do we do that in, in, in accessible ways. So I just would like to end with a message to Open Secrets. Uh, you must now budget as a result of this report for a bit of a pain, a bit of pain, right? Uh, you're going to get attacked, you're going to get a bit vilified, and so on, uh, by the powers that be. And what I would say is that when that comes, which I think it will come in the coming weeks and days, uh, you should remind yourself about what has been often said. Uh, in fact, this quote was is often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, but actually was said by a labor organizer, a trade union organizer in the early 20th century, when he said, first, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then you win. And if tomorrow, Gweda Mantash or uh, any other people in the current political leadership come after you, take comfort from knowing that they're not ignoring you. They're not laughing at you. And the fact that they bother to fight you and attack you, let's hope it means that we are one step away from winning. And once again, thank you for this wonderful report. Thank you for the courage of doing it and the skill with which you've done it. And I really, really hope that you can take this evening to have a nice jaw, enjoy the, the moment, and then you can get plastered tonight and get really drunk and so on, but recognize that by tomorrow morning, you need to be up on your feet to continue the fight because our country, our continent and the world needs people like those that are sitting in that room and those that have made this report happen. Thank you so much uh, and good luck with all that you're doing. Take care. <laughs>Thank you so much, Kumi. That's that's the perfect note to end on, I think, for, for many of us. Um, just very brief, before we do break for refreshments and just for further chat, just brief thank yous. Kumi, first of all, to you again for joining us, uh, what is quite early for you and from very far away. It's been really fantastic to have your voice as part of the discussion. Uh, we so appreciate it. Um, Lutando, Abby, Zen, uh, thank you for your incredible contributions, not just uh, in terms of getting this report to the stage, but particularly for your insights uh, this evening. They've been absolutely fantastic. We really appreciate it. Um, to, to Bertha, the sound people in particular, and Bertha for giving us and helping us uh, set up this space uh, this evening, and to the Open Secrets team, uh, particularly the campaigns team who mm. pulled this off, Mamelo, Zuhair, mm. Norazi, Netokonolo. Thank you uh, so very much. Uh, and then uh, finally, finally, just to say, if everyone has, I heard a couple of people saying, wow, the graphics and everything are really cool on the report. The designer happens to be sitting quietly in the front row here. Uh, so thank you very much, Galen. And if anyone wants to chat to him, uh, he's available afterwards. Um, <laughs> But yes, thank you so much to you for, for coming this evening. Um, and like I said, let's continue the chat now. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.